So uh, we are back for the session uh, multifunctional materials, nanocomposites, innovative technologies, and cultural heritage presentation, uh, preservation. Our first uh, presentation is uh, Elena Kojokar with uh, the work Design of Versatile Bicomponent Platform Collowed with uh, Therapeutic Agents for Wound Dressing Applications. Elena. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I will uh, share start your my presentation. presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes, it is okay. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Elena Kojokaru. Uh, I'm a PhD student at University Politechnica of Bucharest. Uh, and in the next minutes, uh, I will present you my research about uh, design of versatile B-component platform, collaborated with uh, therapeutic agents for wood dressing applications. Um, The main objective of this work was uh, to design an efficient solution for antimicrobial uh, wood dressings by engineering drug and pro-drug collodids B-component platform um, using the combination of um, electrospinning and uh, 3D printing strategies. Electrospinning uh, allows the design of nanofibrous materials uh, with a high specific surface area, a high degree of porosity and uh, permeability, um, versatility uh, in incorporation of bioactive compounds, advanced biomimetic uh, uh, characteristics, uh, which can ensure support and uh, optimal conditions for uh, cell adhesion and uh, proliferation. Um, uh, 3D printing enables the biofabrication of sophisticated architectures uh, in a layer by layer manner, uh, which can fit perfectly with the most complex uh, geometry of any wound. Um, 3D printed hydrogels um, offer benefits for wood, wound dressings uh, due to their ability to mimic the extracellular matrix, um, high porosity and permeability uh, and uh, swelling properties, uh, which facilitate the diffusion of uh, water-soluble drugs out of material and uh, their absorption at the wound site, stimulating skin tissue repairing. Just um, a moment, it, please. Elena, can you please open your camera? Uh, of course. Sorry. It's okay? Uh, it's okay, okay now? Thank you. Um, in order to, to obtain uh, the B component scaffold, uh, firstly, um, uh, it was necessary to design uh, the uh, nanofibrous membrane composed uh, of chitosan and uh, uh, polyethylene oxide uh, containing uh, indometacin prodrug uh, by electrospinning as outer component. Uh, and secondly, uh, the design um, of um, uh, hydrogel uh, of gelatin metacrylate and sodium alginate um, containing, uh, containing uh, um, tetracycline hydrochloride by 3D printing as um, um, inner component. Uh, and uh, the assembling of um, uh, the two components uh, was achieved uh, by printing the hydrogel uh, onto the surface of nanofibrous membrane, um, followed by uh, tetracycline adsorption onto uh, its surface, uh, as can be observed in uh, figure one. Next. Um, 
um, I have to specify that um, uh, the indometacinto drug and uh, gelatin attack relate um, were, syn were synthesized in our laboratory. Uh, and um, in figure, figure two uh, shows um, the obtaining reaction of um, uh, pro drug uh, between indometacin and the polyethylene uh, glycol diamine. Um, using uh, the uh, EDC NHS um, carbodimide uh, system uh, and uh, also the structural uh, characterization uh, by uh, proton NMR spectroscopy uh, and uh, FTIR uh, uh, spectrometry. Um, while figure two or uh, three um, shows uh, the obtaining reaction of uh, gelatin metacrylate uh, between uh, uh, bovine gelatin and metacrylic anhydride, um, along with um, uh, NMR, uh, NMR and uh, FTIR spectra, uh, which demonstrated uh, the successful functionalization of gelatin uh, with metacrylate. Uh, uh, groups. Uh, figure um, four shows the morphology of uncross-linked and cross-linked uh, uh, electrospon membranes. It can be observed uh, that uh, the addition of prodrug uh, led to obtaining um, led to, to obtaining a continuous uh, uniform and beads free uh, nanofibers as compared to uncrosslinked uh, F abbreviated F. Uh, the crosslinking step uh, did not significantly um, change the morphology of um, F sample but led to a denser uh, structure in the case um, of prodrug containing uh, membrane. Uh, same images from uh, figure five uh, shows the features of uh, micro internal architecture of the 3D printed uh, materials. Um, the um, hydrogel uh, presented uh, a more porous and uh, rarefied uh, microstructure compared to hydrogel uh, with tetracycline. Uh, that was characterized by a denser uh, and more compact architecture uh, in which you can be observed uh, the tetracycline molecules absorb uh, on its surface. Uh, in sim, uh, in stem images from figure six, the cross section of uh, B component K fold along uh, with micromorphology of the two uh, structures are presented. Um, the nanofibers uh, continuous architecture of the outer uh, electrospon component uh, and the highly uh, porous structure of um, um, with uh, interconnected pores uh, in the case of inner 3D printed hydrogen. Uh, figure uh, seven uh, exhibits uh, the in vitro drug release profiles of indometacine from prodrug and uh, electrospun nanofiber and of tet tetracycline uh, from uh, hydrogel in PBS uh, at uh, 37 Celsius degree uh, in the presence of enzymes, alpha chemotrypsin and uh, collagenase. From figure A, uh, it appears that um, um, a prodrug presented uh, an extremely uh, slow release of indometacin, um, which was only 33% uh, until the end of the experiment. Uh, this slow, this uh, slow release rate of indometacin uh, was assumed uh, to be associated with a, a much slower uh, hydrolytic uh, uh, cleavage uh, of the stable um, amine bond formed uh, within the product structure. 
uh, and the use of proteolytic enzymes um, led to an accelerated uh, uh, release of indometacin. Uh, in vitro, uh, indometacin um, release profile from nanofibers uh, membrane presented in figure B. Uh, describes um, a biphasic um, model with a birth release within the first uh, eight hours, uh, followed by a controlled and uh, sustained um, one, regardless, regardless of the absence or presence of enzymes, um, thereby uh, increasing its bioavailability and uh, therapeutic effect. In vitro tetracycline uh, release profile, um, from figure C re revealed uh, that uh, the presence of collagenase uh, considerably uh, increased uh, the amount of tetracycline uh, released in the medium, uh, which uh, it could uh, be associated um, uh, with the higher degradation rate of hydrogel uh, due to the gelatin uh, presence in the, in the hydrogel matrix. Um, qualitative, um, uh, quantitative uh, evaluation of in vitro uh, cellular response was performed um, on HELA cell line using MDT uh, compatibility assay. Um, according to figure eight, um, uh, both the uh, uh, the results presented after the uh, twenty four hours of culture, um, the samples presented similar um, levels of cell adhesion. Uh, after seventy two hours, uh, both the control uh, and all the samples uh, registered the significant uh, growth of cell uh, viability, suggesting a great degree of cytocompatibility. Uh, the highest level of um, uh, cell proliferation was indicated by, uh, uh, by the sample uh, abbreviated as uh, FPIMC, uh, uh, nanofibrous membrane uh, with the drug. Uh, that improved um, its um, uh, cell viability value three times compared to, uh, uh, compared to the value registered um, after 24 hours. Um, this can be attributed to the prodrug presence uh, within the nanofibers uh, membrane, uh, which uh, led to uh, the increase um, of hydrophilicity material uh, as well as uh, the slow and gradual uh, release um, of indometacin uh, without affecting uh, the cells. The antimicrobial activity um, was investigated uh, to evaluate the capacity of materials to inhibit uh, the adherence uh, and viability of E. coli and uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus bacteria um, on the scaffold surface. Uh, it is observed that uh, E. coli was uh, less developed on the surface of um, sample H. Uh, compared to Staphylococcus aureus. This uh, may be due to the uh, electrostatic repulsion uh, that occurs between the negative churches um, of uh, sodium alginate and uh, gelatin metacrylate uh, from uh, hydrogel structure and negatively charged E. coli cell surface. The electrostatic uh, attraction between the positive uh, charges of amino groups of chitosan from um, nanofibers uh, membranes um, and cell surface with uh, negative charges uh, can uh, explain uh, the decreased uh, antibacterial uh, activity of um, and electrospun nanofibers against E. coli. Uh, on the contrary, uh, these samples exhibited a favorable uh, antimicrobial activity 
um, against positively charged staphylococcus aureus. Um, it, is, it is also observed that uh, tetracycline uh, um, containing materials displayed uh, a great anti, uh, antimicrobial activity due to the presence of uh, this antibacterial uh, drug, um, which uh, led to the total inhibition of, uh, uh, of bacterial uh, viability. Um, the hydrogel containing uh, tetracycline uh, and uh, bio uh, uh, B component scaffolds demonstrated an, effic an efficient uh, antibacterial activity uh, towards the tested uh, bacteria, regardless, regardless uh, of their type. In conclusion, um, electrospoon and uh, 3D uh, printed uh, B component scaffold with application in uh, Wound dressings was uh, constructed by uh, electrospinning and 3D printing technologies. Uh, same micrographs um, uh, underlined both the uh, nanofibrous architecture of electrospoon membranes um, and the porous microstructure of 3D printed scaffolds. Uh, concerning the drug release profiles, uh, it was not noted uh, that both um, electrospoon membranes and um, hydrogel with tetracycline released uh, the therapeutics in a controlled uh, and high cumulative amount. Uh, and according uh, to the in vitro biocompatibility evaluation, uh, the HELA cell culture exhibited uh, a good viability in the presence of uh, the component scaffold which also manifests a good uh, antimicrobial activity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, here we have any questions from online? If no, I would have a question or maybe more like a comment. Uh, I've seen that uh, the intended use of these uh, composites is for wound dressing. Do you intend to go for the uh, in vivo assay um, to evaluate their uh, wound healing properties finally? Yes, of course. Uh, but um, um, the study um, has not been uh, published, and for this reason, I uh, I selected uh, only a few. Um, a few analyses. Okay, we, um, I understand this, but uh, you you are considering this aspect, yes? Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Marina Aurel Trofin with the work uh, Sulfo Beta in Functionalized Gel and Gum uh, Synthesis Solution and Gel Properties. I would uh, like to ask all the participants to keep their presentation under 10 minutes, please. Hello, can you see my, uh, my screen? Hello. Yes, oh. it's okay, but uh, put it on uh, presentation mode, slideshow. Okay, yes. it's perfect. Hi, my name is Marin and I'm a PhD student at uh, Petroponi Institute of uh, Macromolecular Chemistry. And today I will talk about uh, our uh, uh, a study I do during my PhD thesis about uh, gel and gum and its functionalization with uh, zwitterionic units. First, I will present the materials, the reaction we used, and then the characterization methods used to confirm the structure and also to evaluate the properties of our new polymer. First, zwitterionic polymers are polymers which have both uh, anionic and cationic groups in uh, their structure and in their um, repeating unit. And they, they can be sulfobetaines containing th this sulfonic anion and also carboxybetaines or uh, phosphobetaines. Because of, uh, uh, of these two ionic groups, they can uh, arrange water molecules by ion dipole interactions, which confers good anti-fooling uh, properties such as bacterial or protein adhesion uh, resistance and also biocompatibility. 
Jelan gum is uh, a uh, natural polysaccharide um, uh, secreted by the Pseudomonas elodea uh, bacterium, and it's uh, it's a tetrasaccharide containing two units of glucose, one rum note and one glucuronic acid. And uh, it was approved by FDA since, since the 19th as uh, safe for uh, food uses. And also it, since 2008, it's approved by European list of permitted food additives as, um, as, a, as an, uh, in the European Union. And it is safe to use because it's biodegradable and has low toxicity. We uh, grafted this vitironic monomer onto gelangam using um, ammonium persulfate and uh, uh, tetra tetramethyl ethylene diamine as uh, an init initiation system. We tested uh, various concentrations of the initiator and uh, we found out that uh, the, the 6006 mole per liter in in initiator is the best. Uh, regarding the the yield of this uh, reaction, by uh, FTIR we we see some uh, differences compared compared to to pure gelan, and uh, because we used uh, three different uh, three different amounts of uh, sulfur beta metacrylate of the monomer, we used higher and higher amounts and. This is uh, confirmed by uh, specific peaks, such as the the metacrylate, the one from the uh, esteric group, also uh, the one from the carbon hydrogen group, from the newly introduced methyl and methylene groups, and also we we see an increase in uh, in these bands, which is uh, due to the presence of the uh, sulfur uh, oxygen double bond. Also, we use the NMR, N N uh, proton NMR to evaluate the, um, the grafting reaction, and we can find we can find the specific peaks for the polysulfobetaine beta metacrylates in the in, in the spectra of the um, grafted polymers, and uh, which are not found in the starting polymers. Also, uh, at uh, High chemical shift values. You cannot find anymore the uh, the peak specific to the double bond, which means that our monomer has uh, polymers has reacted. Next, we evaluated the hydrophilic hydrophobic uh, char character of uh, our polymers, and uh, with using Nile red as a fluorescence probe, we um, we we show that our polymers are. Uh, have hydrophobic uh, uh, character and using pyrene and uh, by doing the ratio between the intensity of the uh, first peak and the third peak, we uh, we show that our polymers are uh, quite hydrophilic, also have hydrophilic zones because the, the ratio is above 1.5. Uh, to the zeta potential, across all samples it's about minus 25 minus 30 millivolts which uh, suggests that uh, in uh, aqueous solution our uh, our polymer chains are stable and repel each other so they don't collapse and uh, also by uh, uh, by titration with a polycation we, we we can put in evidence the presence of the carboxyl groups which are um, which come from the gelan with uh, with some observations that uh, the zeteroni groups have a uh, screening some some screening effect on uh, these carboxyl groups and the one uh, very interesting fact about these polymers is that they form a clear perfectly clear gel uh, upon uh, salt addition because the sodium uh, ions tend to screen the ionic repulsions between uh, polymer chains, and they uh, they can come together and uh, uh, form some joints like this. And uh, by uh, DLS, we can measure the the distance between two joints, and uh, which it is called mesh size. So 
we test uh, with, with by DLS we test the gels for three different uh, salt concentrations, and uh, we we found out that uh, the increase in salt concentration is uh, is reducing reducing the mesh size, suggesting an, a stronger and stronger uh, gel. In uh, conclusion, I want uh, I want to conclude that we did the synthesis of this uh, grafted uh, gel and derivative with the Zvitironic units. We confirmed its structure by uh, FTIR and also by NMR spectroscopy. We evaluate its hydrophilic hydrophobic character and also the gel properties, which uh, will be useful in uh, our further research uh, uh, because this, uh, since it is a biocompatible and uh, low cytot cyto cytotoxicity compound, it's, uh, it would be useful in uh, biomedical applications such as uh, drug, drug delivery, local drug delivery, or uh, wound dressings. Lastly, I want to thank the, um, the founder of this research and uh, my PhD coordinator and also uh, our team, our co-workers, and the, the um, uh, the people from the National Hellenic Research Foundation, which uh, helped in the, in these characterizations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, in a more uh, more valuable as it is in uh, international collaboration, as I seen. I had a minor comment, but you answered it uh, in uh, the conclusion section because I wanted to, to ask you what do you, do you intend to do with these uh, composites finally, but you answered it. So if there are any more questions or from online, if no, thank you once again. Thank you. And uh, good luck with uh, the future studies. Thanks. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Adrian Moraro with uh, silver coated magnetic micro microspheres for targeted antimicrobial applications. I will uh, open the presentation right now. We cannot see it. One second. Uh, can you see it so now? Put it on slideshow and uh, oh, first. okay. And uh, let me open my okay. camera if my mouse wants to work. Can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Adrian Moraru. I'm a bachelor student at the uh, Polytechnic University of Bucharest. And today I'm going to talk about silver coated magnetite microspheres for targeted antimicrobial applications. First of all, Magnetite has uh, increased attention in, in the medical field because of its biocompatibility, low toxicity, and low cost. Uh, owning to its um, magnetic properties, it can be directed to using a magnetic field, which can be used in a combination with the, func the functionalization of the surface to create targeted drug delivery systems. In uh, such uh, systems, we can use uh, for example, silver nanoparticles due to their biocompatibility and great antimicrobial properties. The aim of this study is to create silver coated uh, magnetite microspheres uh, for such applications. First of all, we have to synthesize the material. Uh, the magnetite microspheres were synthesized using a uh, um, microwave assisted solvothermal method without inert gas, uh, uh, starting with a single iron source. Um, iron chloride hexahydrate was dissolved into ethylene glycol uh, by magnetic steering until the solution was clear. After that, we added uh, sodium acetate and polyethylene glycol and uh, continued stirring for 30 minutes. The obtained solution was you know, inserted into an autoclave and uh, we started to uh, and we started to synthesize the uh, particles at 200 degrees Celsius. After that, the, the particles were uh, separated using a magnet, washed with uh, the ionized water and the centrifuge uh, and the centrifuge three times 
to get rid of, of all the impurities. After that, the particles were dried in the oven at 60 degrees Celsius for eight hours. The obtained particles were dispersed with uh, silver night. Uh, night. Sorry, I'm uh, all over the place. With uh, a silver um, precursor in water using ultrasonication for 30 minutes. After that, we added sodium hydro hydroxide, polyvinyl pyrrolidone, and uh, ammonium hydroxide. Continued the ultrasonication for another 30 minutes. And this solution was added drop by drop in a glucose solution. Uh, while uh, constantly um, stirring. The obtained uh, particles were separated, washed with uh, deionized water, centrifugated, and dried in the uh, oven at 60 degrees Celsius for eight hours. First of all, we, uh, uh, we will talk about the X-ray diffraction made on these obtained particles. As you can see, uh, the control probe is the one without, uh, sil uh, without silver. And we can um, clearly see that we obtained the single phase crystalline magnetite structure. The coating was successful, as we can see from the uh, appearing of the peaks um, specific to silver. Because of these peaks are, uh, are uh, grouped with uh, magnetite peaks, we can, uh, safe we can safely say that we have a heterostructure, um, we obtain a heterostructure. From the same images, we can uh, see the morphology of the particles. Before coating, the particles had a quasi spherical st uh, structure with a dimension of uh, around 98 nanometers. The morphology did not change for lower silver concentrations, from, as we can see. And at higher concentrations, we can see some uh, polyedral structures, which can be associated to silver nanoparticles that were obtained because we had an excess of silver in the solution. Also, we determined the uh, thickness of the silver uh, on the particles, which was uh, between five and uh, 10 nanometers, depending on the concentration of silver. The EDX spectra of uh, our materials confirmed the fact that the coating was successful. And because of the increase the intensity of the peaks for higher concentrations, we can uh, safely say that uh, we also have nanoparticles in the material. The FTIR spectra showed us the specific band for uh, iron oxygen bond, both for uh, tetrahedral and octahedral sites. We can also see the specific bands for uh, carbon oxygen and carbon hydrogen bonds from uh, polyethylene glycol. Both, uh, the interesting uh, thing in this is that uh, we can see the bands on the uncoated magnetite, which suggests that uh, the particles obtained were already functionalized, which can allow us to have uh, less steps into the process of obtaining drug delivery systems. Also, because uh, the bands are still uh, present in the materials with silver, that means that uh, we can also functionalize further the material, uh, even though we have uh, silver on the surface. The band that uh, which is not assigned is just uh, from the spectral matter used. It's the diamond uh, that uh, showed us showed on uh, the spectrum. We also uh, did the uh, dynamic light scattering. From the uh, results, you can see that uh, the hydrodynamic diameter increases with uh, concentration of silver, which is uh, logical because uh, both the uh, dimension of the particle increases and uh, the interaction with the solvent also increases because of this. And we can also have some agglomerates in those structure. The slight increase from uh, the two concentrations of silver 
from a sample two to sample three is because uh, we added uh, so uh, more silver on the surface. The decrease from sample three to sample four, even though we added more silver, is because uh, the hydroxide groups from polyethylene glycol were blocked. And uh, that means that, uh, it means that the interactions with the solvent were so low that uh, they are negligible. Also, we can see that uh, the zeta potential of the particles decrease with the addition of silver, which means uh, that uh, we can have agglomerates on the, because of the silver. Also, the decrease, uh, for example, four can appear from uh, the operation of silver uh, nanoparticles, which uh, have a natural tendency to agglomerate. In conclusion, we were able to obtain uh, silver, co silver coated ma um, magnetite microspheres with uh, good uh, property with good uh, properties, which can be applied in med the medical field. In the future, we are going to um, do analysis on the antimicrobial and the biocompatibility of the material, and also we are going to add drugs to the material to see if uh, we can further functionalize it and use it in, continue, uh, in uh, this field. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, if not, I do have one question. Did you synthesize separately the silver nanoparticles in order to evaluate them? Because you said there are nanoparticles, and uh, I think they sh they should uh, have a characterization by uh, themselves alone. This is one uh, question. And uh, I am... before the, you answer, could you go back to X-ray diffraction data, please? Of course. There you go. So from what I see, I see here, but uh, there is not something sure. But it seems like you have silver oxide, not silver. Uh, silver should have uh, its main uh, uh, XRD peak around 38 point something degrees. I think there uh, is a silver oxide around 36 degrees. So this should be clarified. And the, if you do the synthesis separately and characterize the silver separately, it would be easier to, to do that. Yeah, I'm going to do that. We did not uh, expect to have uh, separated silver, silver nanoparticles during the process, but uh, we are going to do some more uh, evaluation on it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you and good luck with uh, the future studies, especially those of antimicrobial and uh, biocompatibility assays. Thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Alkali Mohamed with uh, design of uh, liquid crystals based on copper complexes with uh, benzoyl theoria. It's also online. Alkali. It's... I'm here, I'm here. I'm trying to share my screen here. Okay, we can see your presentation. Can you please open your camera? Okay. And also your microphone, we cannot hear you. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Mohamed Alkali from the Department of Inorganic and Organic Chemistry, Biochemistry and Catalysis, University of Bucharest. Um, I'm a PhD student, and uh, my topic for today is on the design of liquid crystals based on copper one complexes with benzyl urea ligands. Okay. okay. Um, a brief summary of my presentation is I'm going to be uh, making available, I will present um, five promesogenic benzyl urea ligands. 
as well as um, the corresponding copper one complexes that were made out of them. Um, that is um, from copper two highlight soils of bromide, iodide, as well as chloride. And um, what we did was um, the liquid crystalline properties, the, the, the properties were investigated via a collaborative study of um, the polarizing optical microscope, the differential scaling calorimetry, as well as the X-ray pore that diffraction. And um, the structure of the compounds that were prepared were all confirmed using NMR. Furthermore, due to the property induced by the complexation of the copper one moiety, the emission properties that was gotten was also studied for those that were luminescent. So first of all, let me give a brief introduction of what liquid crystals are. Um, we all know that um, solids, the atoms in solids are arranged in a definite manner, whereas for liquids, they do not have, a, uh, the, the atoms do not have definite pattern of arrangements. However, in situations where you have um, um, a material that tends to blend the property of both solids as well as liquid states, then that material is usually termed as a liquid crystals, which is in other words, they are sometimes referred to as disordered solid or maybe ordered um, liquid. So these liquid crystals are also referred to as the mesophase. And liquid crystals um, have um, a variety of um, occurrences. There are some that are referred to as the chiral or cholesterolic liquid crystals. There are the smectic liquid crystals as well as the pneumatic. From the picture here, you could see that um, for the smectic liquid crystals, um, they are arranged in different layers, but they do not have um, the same position, just like um, the solid. Whereas for pneumatic, even though they are under the same, um, like um, represented here like a box, however, the positions are not fixed. So um, an important application um, property that is usually derived from liquid crystals is the long range um, and isotropic long range order that is usually gotten from them, which makes it necessary to get applications in um, digital watches, televisions, and meters, cell phones, among others. So another aspect of this study is um, what is referred to as the metallomesogenes. So when um, the promesogenic ligands, that is, um, or ligands are complexed with metal and the resulting um, compound is a liquid crystal, they are often termed as metallomesogenes. So what happens is that this complexation or incorporation of the metal into the organic matrix, it tends to enhance and induce unique magnetic spectroscopic as well as radius properties on the resulting materials. So this is the reaction scheme for the prepared compounds. So basically the whole idea is um, the fact that um, the availability of um, this um, ethyl, um, three, four dihydroxy um, benzoid, as well as um, the availability of um, four hydroxy um, acetylenolide makes it possible for us to be able to um, design benzoyl tyria with different alkyl chains, that is having long alkyl chains, having different alkoxy substitutions. So basically what we do first was to carry out um, the alkylation that is the Williamson ether synthesis um, on the ester um, derivative as well as on this um, anilide derivatives. So on both of them, what we wanted to do was to be able to create both parts. That is because if you look at the benzoltyria on both sides um, from different literatures, it has been established that compounds that exist as um, liquid crystals, they tend to have this kind of um, arrangement, having long alkyl chains on both sides of the aromatic ring. So based on this, we try to make um, benzoltyria starting from these two starting materials, which I said, and for each step, for each step you could see that um, like for the Williamson ether synthesis, because of the long alkyl chains, it took around three days and this reaction was monitored um, through TLC as well as this. And um, during the process leading to the preparation of the actual benzothyurea, the reaction takes place under um, nitrogen atmosphere and we ensured that um, the solvent as well as the substrates that were used for all the reaction leading to the formation of the benzothyurea were in actual dry condition. And then after the benzoyltyria was obtained, we were able to carry out some complexation with the corresponding copper halide. The reaction was done in ethanol and um, 
from here, um, we have I have um, represented the ligands which you obtained as L1, laid them from L1 up to L6. So from this list, all of them all the ligands showed liquid crystalline properties except the one labeled with L5. And I'm going to explain during the course of my presentation. So next is to look at um, the proton NMR for the for proton NMR spectra for the um, benzoyl tyria, which I have produced as well as the ligands. So from this, you could see that um, this is um, um this is some um, um, a benzoethyria that has a 12, car um, 12 carbon alkoxy chain on one side and then a fluorine atom on the other side. So the, the in in the proton NMR, the important peaks in this case, which we are trying to look at, are these two NH protons. As you can see, you have NH proton. This is around twelve point nine nine, and this is around nine point zero seven, and um, these are actually the aromatic protons. This um, triplet proton here is um, attributed to the first carbon atom, which is attached to the oxygen on this attachment. And these are just the other chains of the hydrogen left. So when you compare the ligand with um, the methyl mesogenes, that is the complexes formed, the only difference that you will see are just in the shift of um, this proton, which exists between the carbonyl as well as the thiamide, um, between the carbonyl as well as the thiocarbonyl group. And um, this is usually attributed to hydrogen bonding of this hydrogen with the halide um, ion resulting from the complex formation. So you could see the only difference between this and um, the other complexes was just a shift of this particular proton. So this tends to confirm the structure of um, the ligand as well as the corresponding complexes. And the same thing can be said for others. Um, for this, the difference between this and the one which I just um, presented was, um, in this case, there's an additional alkyl substitution on position three. And in this case, it means that those um, triplets peak, they are going to be, when you zoom, they are going to be two in number. So that is just the difference. And, in terms of the shift is also similar, which confirms the structure. And the same thing can be said for this, in which we substituted cyanide on the other side. And then this on this side, we have 10 carbon atoms on both sides. And um, so it's just a confirmation of the structure. And we, we used NMR to confirm the structure. So after that, um, these are the transition temperatures as well as um, a representation of this uh, of the liquid crystalline phases that were observed for the ligands as well as the corresponding complexes. So these transitions were assigned using um, the polarizing optical microscope as well as the differential scanning calorimetry. So for this particular ligand that has um, six carbon atoms on both sides, um, upon heating from crystalline, it moves directly to the isotropic liquid. But when you cool, has been observed on the microscope, there is formation of a smectic A phase. And um, the clearing temperature, um, so it um, moves into the glassy state just around 103 degrees. However, an important um, property of um, complexing these particular complexes with um, these particular ligands with complexes, the fact that it tends to stabilize the liquid crystalline phase. So you could see when we reacted with, um, we made a complex with copper chloride. We had, um, upon heating, we had smectic A, and uh, upon cooling, we had smectic C and then smectic A. And uh, the temperature range is now from 120 down to 72. And then from, for, for the bromide analog, it also showed smectic C, smectic A when we're heating, and then upon cooling, it had just smectic A. And then for the other one, which has 10 carbon atoms on both sides, you could see that. Um, the ligand showed smectic A upon heating and also smectic A and smectic C was observed upon cooling. These are just observations on the microscope. And um, when it was complex with bromide, chloride, and iodide, it also showed smectic A as well as in this in chloride, it shows smectic C phases, among others, and this tends to exist in glassy states. And then for the third one, we could see we, we tried to increase the length to 12 carbon atoms on both sides and the ligand 
tends to show smectic C and smectic A upon heating and upon cooling, we saw smectic A and um, just like the previous ones, um, or when you complex, it tends to increase the temperature range in which the existence liquid crystals, that is, it stabilizes the liquid crystalline phase. So what we then tend to do was to try to, instead of having um, um, symmetry, we tend to reduce, um, um, replace one of the alkoxy chain with just a flow uh, with a fluorine on the other side. And surprisingly, we also saw um, a liquid crystalline phase on this particular um, complex. And this is usually the, this property is attributed to the, to the fluorine that has been attached. And you can see that there is, um, there is um, smectic A from 104 to 114 when we heated and when we cooled, it's um, from isotropic liquid to smectic A um, and to, to crystal and the range was from 110 to 88. However, when we complexed with copper chloride, we could see we had smectic C, we had smectic A. And then here we had smectic A upon cooling and um, the temperature has not increased up to 145 and the crystallization point is now 83. So I similar can things. Like... Can you prepare for the conclusions, please? Okay, okay. So this is just um basically for, for this, it does not show liquid crystalline property. And then for the cyano, it also had liquid crystalline property, but for the ligand, it was quite um, a, a very short range, but when we complex, it had longer range. And um, this is the DSC as well as the um, polarizing optical micros. This is the picture that we observed from the from the polarizing optical microscope. And from the DSC, we could see the transition from glass to smectic A, smectic A to ISO, and so on. And the same thing can be explained. This is the DSC. This is the picture representing smectic A. But this is a picture representing smectic C, and these are the different transitions. And um, this is also smectic A, and so on. And um, this is XRD, which was taken at a temperature uh, in which the ligand uh, liga structural complexes exist as a liquid crystals, and um, the phases were confirmed. And um, also, we tried to check the emission spectra. Um, at the solid states using excitation wavelength of 365. And um, well, there are different, um, this is just a general um, plot to show all the complexes that had luminescent property. And um, this is usually attributed to the transition of copper one complex excited state of a triplet metal to the ligand charge transfer. So in conclusion, um, new benzoyl theory ligands Having liquid crystalline properties and corresponding three coordinate component complexes have been prepared and successfully characterized. And then we've seen that when we complex these BTU ligands to the copper one moiety, it tends to induce luminescence and also stabilizes the liquid crystalline phase to larger temperature. So, in terms of the actual application, because liquid luminescent liquid crystalline compounds provide an isotropic long range order and polarized emission that should improve performance parameters so based on this. Copper, which is cheaper alternative to iridium and palladium, and also shows exceptional liquid crystal and luminescent properties, is being exploited for this purpose. So I thank you all for listening. Thank you very much for a very, uh, very interesting presentation with, uh, with lots of results. If we have uh, any questions from the room or from the online, if not, uh, I would like to, to thank you for the presentation. Wish you good luck with uh, your PhD thesis. You are in a very, very good uh, research group at University of Bucharest. And I am very glad that uh, you have in mind the potential application. This is uh, very nice to see. Yeah. So uh, thank, you. thank you very much for your presentation and good luck. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Toma Fistosh with uh, the work Innovative Material for the Consolidation, Conservation, and Reinforce of Underwater Wood Cultural Heritage.
Hello, greetings. I try to keep it short. My name is Toma Fistos and I am a scientific researcher from Team 7 Nano Emerging Nanotechnologies at uh, EJEC in Bucharest. And today I'm going to present the start of the BioCool project, uh, namely innovative uh, materials for the consolidant conservation and reinforcement of uh, underwater wood uh, of cultural heritage. As uh, every term at the beginning, cultural heritage uh, started uh, as a simple one. We included the tangible cultural heritage, uh, who is separate in uh, movable heritage and immovable heritage, like uh, historic buildings, monuments, paintings, sculptures, and uh, furniture. But uh, fast forward, uh, it uh, developed uh, rapidly and start to include uh, the intangible part of the oral tradition, not natural landscape, traditional skills, food, rituals, and uh, religions. Some important moments in the history of cultural heritage are the 20, uh, 19th century, uh, when uh, it happened centralization and protection of objects, uh, cultural value lead to the creation of national museum an institution for the protection of monuments. Uh, the other, uh, mon uh, the other uh, moment was the Second and the First World Wars, especially the Second World War and other conflicts, which uh, we know uh, in the Second World War, uh, Berlin or Dresden was uh, eradicated from the earth. And uh, in the Middle East, uh, countries like uh, Iran, Iraq, and uh, Afghanistan uh, are uh, hardly damaged by uh, wars religious wars and uh, after the second uh, world war uh, in the 20th centuries uh, precisely in uh, november 1945 uh, unesco was uh, founded the risk and the factors uh, who damage the cultural heritage properties are uh, vast and uh, i can make a presentation only just with the factors and the risk but shortly, we also we can uh, separate this in uh, two categories: in natural disasters, who are uh, incontrollable, and uh, anthropogenic ones, who are made by uh, men. Some uh, notable uh, natural disasters, I think, are the volcanic er volcanic eruption, who we think uh, eradicate Pompeii from the earth, uh, and uh, in the same time uh, conserve him. Um, the global warming are uh, another problem for uh, the coastal uh, cultural heritage um, because of the sea rising. The fast growing population also, um, also are a factor who goes to pollutant and uh, urbanization. And another fact, an other uh, important factor is biodegradation due to the organic support material like uh, wood, leather, or um, paper. That is why the coating material needs to be needs to have an antimicrobial part to conserve the heritage objects. It was developed uh, seven level of uh, reinforcement to say like that. But uh, the most important uh, aspects when you are dealing with uh, cultural heritage is that uh, the treatment does not affect the heritage objects. So prevention uh, in refers to protecting the cultural assets if you can to control the environment. The conservation is uh, keep it in the same condition. The coating material do not uh, need to affect the heritage object. The consolidation is the physical applying of the material. Uh, the reinforcement is uh, reviving the original concept of the objects and uh, reconstruction, reproduction, and uh, rehabilitation if it's uh, needed. It's uh, copying an existing uh, artifact. How we know in the history, I, like uh, Berlin was uh, rebuilt by uh, pictures or uh, Dresden or. Uh, the aim of the project, the main objective of the project is to develop innovative nanomaterial with a role in the preservation and con consolidation of the cultural heritage. The obtained reinforcing material consists of the polymeric parts, natural synthesized to provide compatibility with the wood mass. 
and an antimicrobial part, natural or synthesized phosphatic material to provide protecting against um, biodegradation. In the, in the slides, uh, you have uh, two pictures with the apathetic material that uh, we obtain by the method of co-precipitation by uh, mixing calcium nitrate and um, uh, zinc or copper salt, uh, after which uh, the ammonium phosphor was added. The reaction took place uh, at uh, 80 Celsius degrees at pH 10 in uh, three hours. After that, uh, we wash the compound with the water to eliminate the ammonium excess and uh, mix it with uh, ethanol to form a gel or a pasta. And uh, after that, we dry them uh, at uh, 45 uh, Celsius degrees. You have uh, some same images of the compound and uh, edX uh, spectra of them. The characterization method for uh, this part, we chose the X-ray fluorescence and the thermogravimetric analysis. The X-ray fluorescence, uh, in the X-ray fluorescence, we identified the peaks of interest uh, as uh, culture and uh, heavy metals, copper and zinc. And the thermogravimetric analysis showed that the compound of interest are uh, thermically stable. In the conclusion, uh, cultural heritage is of particular importance as it uh, represents human identity and evidence of uh, existing and activities that people have left uh, behind over time. The factors that lead to the degradation of cultural heritage are, are uh, multiple, uncontrollable, and uh, some case, uh, some causes by uh, nature of uh, or a man. Multiple apathetic materials were synthesized by the method of co-precipitation, substituted with different heavy metal metals at different ratio, and the apathetic materials were characterized by uh, XRF and um, TEGIA method. In the future, we will try to synthesize the other phosphatic material. Qualitative and quantitative tests need to be performed to show that the compound obtained uh, have uh, antimicrobial property. We need to choose or purchase the uh, to purchase or synthesize the polymeric material to offer uh, count, uh, coating uh, properties and um, uh, and to be to offer counting properties. The inclusion of uh, phosphoric material uh, in the polymer, natural or synthesized, chosen. Application of the innovative nanomaterial on different type uh, of woods. And if uh, the previous stage will be complete with positive result, we will try to apply the nanoparticles obtained on the wooden uh, heritage objects. Thank you for Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Toma. Do we have any questions from the room or from online? Yes, maybe could I have a uh, Not, short thank you very much. comment? What Toma didn't mention, this is a work uh, performed on the internal grants. We have uh, this year some internal grants for our uh, young uh, researchers. So we, we will wait for you at Trio Chem and uh, the next year at Next Chem with uh, the final results. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next, next uh, presenter is uh, Cosmina Andrea Alexe with Advanced Materials for Thermoresponsive Surfaces Design. Hello everybody, I'm uh, Kozmin Andrei Alexe. I'm a PhD student at uh, the University of Bucharest and also a researcher at the National Institute for Textiles and Leather. Today I will present a uh, work in progress uh, PhD thesis, um, a more applicated, I think, uh, work uh, called Advanced Materials for Thermoresponsive uh, Surfaces Design. As an introduction, I want to mention that uh, from even from prehistoric time, uh, the leather was um, 
uh, important material for construction of uh, shelters and provide body protection. Um, also, it is it is a need that uh, um, uh, we need to transform the food industry waste into material with uh, various uh, uh, properties as uh, mechanical strength, stability in dry and wet conditions uh, with uh, various application from automotive uh, leather to uh, antimicrobial leather um, and uh, sensitive properties. Uh, as uh, objectives, I want to obtain an alternative for the dry finishing process of hides. Uh, that's them for clothing and uh, footwear industry um, with sensitive uh, properties um, regarding the thermal effects. Um, uh, using uh, uh, cholesteric liquid crystals. Another um, objective is to obtain an easy and uh, green alternative to compatibilize the leather surface with uh, the liquid crystals. Uh, the leather is uh, the hides is produced by vertebrates. Um, it contains mainly uh, in dermis the collagen, and uh, it took like uh, 23 steps to make a finished product. Uh, the main important uh, processing uh, steps are the tanning that um, stabilize mycotic and mitotic uh, leather, and uh, also the surface finishing that uh, gives the leather um, the um, coating the ceiling that uh, offers uh, sensorial properties, which uh, interests uh, us in uh, uh, our work, and uh, also um, attractive effects. Uh, chiral liquid crystals are um, special by uh, the structure, which um, is constituent with uh, molecules with uh, that form a um, twisted helical configuration. Um, the interesting fact about the chiral liquid crystals are uh, is the fact that uh, uh, using an external factor of a physical or chemical nature can cause the structure to alter and change color. Um, oh, sorry. Um, first step was to synthesize the cholesteric liquid crystals from uh, uh, cholesterol polargonate and uh, oleyl um, cholesterol uh, chloride. Uh, and after this, I brushed the natural bovine leather with uh, those uh, cholesterol liquid crystals. And uh, after heating uh, the leather, uh, the um, uh, changing of color of the liquid crystals appear. And uh, also uh, after this, I finished uh, the leather to, in order to obtain a more resistant uh, finishing. Um, another um, experiment that uh, I made with uh, my professor was to integrate the cholesterol liquid crystals with an um, adhesive, um, the NO65. After uh, we dissolved the um, cholesterol uh, liquid crystals in uh, dichloromethane, uh, mixed with uh, the monomer uh, NOAA 65 uh, steering, and after this, uh, mixed with uh, a solution of PVA. 
And uh, after exposing at uh, 365 nanometers, we obtain an um, um, elastic film um, deposit on uh, leather uh, on a uh, cardboard here. I have the image, the leather is uh, in progress. Um, and uh, the properties were uh, good. Uh, as conclusion, uh, that there is a complex, not homogeneous materials with unique uh, hygienic and uh, durable properties due to the collagen-based structures. Uh, modern life uh, requires a continuous connection to smart materials. Liquid crystals are smart materials with advanced application in electronics uh, and very few known applications in uh, leather, but with huge potential. Uh, also, leather surface finishing with uh, liquid crystals additives paves the way for uh, new advanced and smart materials from watch belts to automotive uh, upholstery leathers to protection uh, like uh, firefighters uh, equipment and so on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. I actually uh, recently seen some of your works. So uh, good luck uh, with all your work, with your, uh, your PhD studies. If we have any questions from the room or from online, mm -hmm. if not, thank you once again. Our next speaker is uh, Claudio Eduard Rizescu with uh, the work considerations regarding one pot synthesis of silver, silver oxide uh, composites. Good as you are, Mausit. Mausit? Da, da, da. Ah, perfect. Perfect. O să dau un share screen. Uh, imediat. Da. Um. Uh, imediat. Uh, my name is Claudio Rizescu, and today I'm going to to present consideration regarding one pot synthesis of silver, silver oxide, zinc, aluminum, layer double hydroxide composites. Um, layer double hydroxide are a class of anionic clays, um, natural or synthetic. They uh, structurally, they consist of uh, 2D layers uh, con that contain um, bivalent and trivalent metallic hydroxides and uh, they are positively charged. Uh, this positive charge is compensated by the interlayer anions that um, give the interlayer um, composition. Uh, many metallic, uh, many transition metals, especially 3D groups, uh, can form layer double hydroxide uh, structure. Uh, however, many other metal cations can enter a uh, layer double hydroxide structure. Um, due to their um, versatility and uh, easy of uh, synthesize, uh, they were successfully uh, used as catalyst, uh, anion absorbents, polymer composites, flame retardants, bio-nanohybrids, or even consolidants in the field of uh, conservation of cultural heritage. Um, silver um, decorated layer double hydroxide. Uh, when the, um, the surface of the layer hydroxide are covered in hydroxyl groups, these hydroxyl groups are able to anchor uh, multiple um, nanoparticles, if the right condition are met, but they also can work as a substrate for the growth of uh, various particles, various nanoparticles, and uh, especially silver-based nanoparticles. Uh, if uh, silver 
based um, nanoparticles are grown on the surface of layer double hydroxide, this material gain additional properties such as bacteriostatic, anion, anion exchanging properties of, uh, and different potential self-cleaning properties for the final treated materials. However, these materials were synthesized uh, many times before, but uh, usually they contain the synthesis contain multiple steps, which uh, might not be um, good for a material used as a consolidant for the um, cultural buildings. Um, so um, in this work, I decided to do a simple um, one pot synthesis, starting from the metallic uh, nitrate salts and um, to see how will these uh, materials act and um, which to see the properties of these materials. Um, material preparation. Uh, the we used two methods to prepare these materials, these composites. First, we started from a determined uh, volume of solution. Um, we started from the zinc nitrate, aluminum nitrate and silver nitrate salts. And we used 100 milliliter solution of sodium hydroxide, 2.25 molar, and uh, sodium carbonate, 0.65 molar. Um, the, the, the metallic salts were calculated, so um, the, all the um, metallic cations to be precipitated. Um, in the first method, we, we used the fast addition of the metallic salts under constant steering and the final pH of the slurry was measured to be between 11 and 12, 11.5, something like that. The precipitate was aged at 800, at 18 degrees Celsius, filtered, uh, washed and dried in there. The material was uh, named silver layer double hydroxide one. From the second method, we used a technique of co-precipitation of low supersaturation and constant pH starting from the metallic nitrate salts. Uh, also the precipitate obtained, uh, we maintain the, the um, pH at uh, the value of 10 for the whole precipitation. The precipitate was aged, filtered, washed and dried in air. Same as the, as the first material. The material was called silver layer double hydroxide 2. The material were investigated by XRD, X-ray diffraction. And um, we see here that the, um, both the phase and the crystallinity of the materials differ from one another. Um, all the, both material present the diffraction line characteristic to a layer double hydroxide structure with nitrate anion as the compensating anion. Uh, and additionally, from the for the first material, silver layer double hydroxide one, additional diffraction lines can be observed, which correspond to a, another layer double hydroxide structure, but this containing carbonate as the compensating anion. Uh, the silver in this material uh, is um, in form of silver carbonate or um, even metallic silver can be obtained for this material, probably due to the higher pH or uh, during this synthesis. From the second materials, we observe, we observe the same layer double hydroxide structure, but with a lower, much lower crystallinity than for the first material. Um, we also observe some diffraction line characteristic to um, zinc oxide in form of worsit. Um, we can see here that um, the addition of silver nitrate alongside the precursor, alongside the silver nitrate, uh, alongside the zinc nitrate and aluminum nitrate as precursor did not affect the formation of the layer double hydroxide phase, but it influenced the, um, let's say the um, condition influenced the phase obtained not the addition of silver. Um, the material were um, also investigated by wa wavelength dispersive X-ray uh, fluorescence. And uh, here we can see that the theoretic, that the um, real 
zinc to aluminum molar ratio are close to the intended value. However, small, small amounts of aluminum were lost during synthesis, probably because the um, actual ratio is higher than the theoretical ratio. We can see here that also the um, uh, silver reported to the total number of cations is close to the intended value. So um, here we see that the silver was not lost during synthesis. Uh, results in conclusion, the addition of the silver along the layer double hydroxide precursor did not affect the formation of the layer double hydroxide phase. Um, and surprisingly here, we can see that uh, the first method, which is a little bit uh, simpler, starting from the um, well-determined um, quantities of metallic salts and the um, co-precipitation agent, led to the formation of um, a better crystallized layer double hydroxide phase and the formation of uh, metallic silver. Um, probably the particles of metallic silver are deposed on the surface of layer double hydroxide in form of composite material. Uh, presence of the carbonate in the pH used during synthesis has impacted this crystallinity phase and type of silver containing phase. The high pH of the final slurry in case of the first material has favored probably the formation of uh, metallic silver. Silver cations were not lost during synthesis. Uh, aluminum content is lower than the theoretical value uh, determined at the beginning. Um, the material we obtained will be further tested in various applications in our future test in culture in conservation of cultural heritage. Um, thank you for your attention. This Thank you very much for your presentation. If uh, we have any questions from the room or for, from online. If no, uh, thank you once again. Ah, we... You're welcome. Ah, no, sorry. We don't have any questions. So uh, thank you for your uh, presentation and uh, good luck with your, with, uh, your further studies. Thank you studies. for your attention. Our next uh, presenter, it's um, from online because uh, they are not uh, in uh, in Romania right now. So Julia Nebla with uh, molecular, molecularly imprinted nanogels for spike S1 protein recognition. Uh, please keep uh, your presentations under 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will share my screen right now. Uh, okay, I hope you can see it. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. okay. So, start the slideshow, please. Yep, uh, by the way. Come on. Okay, so hello again, everyone. My name is Julia Nebla, and today I'll present uh, my work entitled uh, Molecularly Imprinted Nanogels for Spike S1 Protein Recognition. Um, as part of my presentation, I will make a short introduction about what is spike protein and why work with it, and what about molecularly imprinted nanogels. I will continue to say a few things about the materials and methods I used for the polyethylene glycol diacrylate synthesis and molecularly imprinted and non-imprinted nanogel synthesis. Also, I will present a few results regarding the new materials and some general conclusions. Okay, so as for what is the spike protein and why work with it? I guess everybody heard uh, lately that the spike protein is a key component of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which was responsible to the production of the COVID-19 disease. Uh, this protein is a trimeric uh, glycoprotein, which enables the fusion process from the viral to host cell membranes. Uh, this protein is found on the surface of the virus and is uh, composed of two regions uh, known as S1 and S2. The part which I am interested in my study is composed of the S1 region, which contains the receptor binding domain. Uh, this domain binds the receptors of the virus to the cell, uh, to the host cell surface. By um, why work with this kind of protein? Uh, because this protein is uh, uh, a very important therapeutic uh, target uh, 
by entrapping or working with this protein, we can block the viral entry into the host cell and therefore stop the spreading of the infection. Uh, so that's why the target of my study is to develop a, ki a new kind of material, a new kind of efficient therapeutic device, which can stop the spreading of the viral entry from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, in order to create this kind of devices, um, I used the uh, molecular imprinting technique. Uh, it was chosen because it's a very high, uh, it has a very high selectivity, stability, reusability, and compatibility with this kind of application. The main principle of molecular imprinting is based on the formation of cavities in, the pol in a polymer matrix with an affinity for a chosen template molecule. In my case, the chosen template molecule will be the S1 receptor binding domain. After the removal of the template molecule, the final functional material can be used uh, in uh, processes of recognition and binding in different domains. That's why in my study, I applied this molecular imprinting technique um, in, for inverse mini emulsion polymerization process in order to obtain a molecular imprinted nanogels. The desired material that I wish to obtain have several advantages, such as a nanoparticle size lower than 500 nanometers, providing them actually with uh, antibody-like behavior. Uh, they, have all, they should have also reusability, versatility, biocompatibility, and resistance to biological interference. Um, regarding the materials I used in my study, uh, in order to obtain this kind of antibody-like particles, I would, I would need to use biocompatible polymers. Um, so that's why the study, uh, my study started by synthesizing polyethylene glycol deacrylate of molecular weight of 2000, starting from polyethylene glycol using two functionalization methods. The first one uh, was performed using acryloyl chloride, and the second one was performed using acrylic acid. Uh, the latest one with acrylic acid determined actually a 93% yield uh, and the higher purity in the final compound. And as indicated in the proton NMR here in, on this slide, um, I calculated the functionality of the final product to be 1.647, so close to two, with a degree of functionalization of 83%, indicating actually a pretty good successful functionalization uh, process with acrylic acid method. Uh, continuing with the um, molecular imprinted nanogels, for this synthesis, I used two steps of uh, two types of macromonomers, uh, polyethylene glycol deacrylate of 2000 uh, molecular weight and 700. The inverse mini emulsion process requires two phases, the continuous phase represented by cyclohexane, which also contains the um, dissolved uh, surfactants, and the aqueous phase in which the monomers were dissolved. The comparative study actually requires the synthesis of two types of nanogels, the one that is obtained in presence of the template molecule, MIP, and the one without the template molecule, MIP. The composition and the thermostability of the open uh, nanogels was also studied uh, from the infrared spectra of the MIP, NIP, and the extracted MIP. This actually is also a molecular imprinted nanogel from which the template molecule was removed, so it was purified. Uh, we can observe that the samples present uh, typical peaks of the um, uh, macromonomer uh, compound of the polyethylene glycol deacrylate. Also for MIP samples, we can see uh, I, uh, the peaks characteristic for the amides and the proteins could not e so easily be seen due to the overlapping of the intensity bands. But other interesting peaks can be seen at 625 um, wave number, which might be attributed to the presence of the emulsifiers in the non-purified uh, MIP particles. Also, the thermal behavior of the nanoparticles was studied and samples MIP and NIP uh, NIP and MIP extracted indicated only one main degradation stage uh, due to the destruction of the polymer matrix. And the sample MIP, which was not purified, shown an interesting thermal behavior with the maximum two maximum values, uh, which I personally attributed it to the, either the destruction of amino acids from the protein structure or either confirming uh, the presence of the emulsifiers in the nanoparticle. I also performed a 
perform the DLS analysis, which uh, highlight the mean size of the synthesized nanoparticles. They were analyzed in PBS and indicated two types of populations with a low intensity agglomeration, agglomerated areas. Uh, the mean values were mostly in the range of 120, 160, with an exception for the mid particles, which are kind, kind of bigger, 230, because uh, they still contain emulsifiers, so the particles indicated the bigger um, size. Uh, we also studied the, morphologic, the morphology of the particles. Uh, here, it confirmed the spherical and really well-defined structure of the nanoparticles, but with no significant differences between MIP and NIP. And uh, as a general conclusion, um, my molecular imprinted nanogels with a potential affinity towards the spike, pro the spike S1 protein were successfully synthesized using inverse mini emulsion polymerization process. The functionalization of uh, polyethylene glycol was successfully performed at a high yield using two methods, obtaining in the end the functionalization of almost 1.7 with 80% functionalization degree. Uh, the composition of the particles was also confirmed by infrared analysis, and the presence of the proteins and emulsifier in the nanogels is supported by the thermal degradation behavior. Uh, the size of the nanoparticles was also confirmed by the DLS analysis, showing values below 200 nanometers, and also the morphological characterization indicates a well-defined spherical uh, structure, uh, and the size is also sustained the DLS measurements. As future perspectives, of course, the study is, the study is ongoing right now. Uh, I would, uh, we will uh, do a protein characterization and quantification studies. Uh, and also we would, uh, we have to do the proving of the potential affinity of the nanogels towards this spike S1 protein. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. We will be expecting you back with the uh, results obtained uh, in the um, yes uh, in uh, your Erasmus stage. Yes. So we have one question from the room. Yep. Hello and congratulations for your work. I would like to ask you uh, about uh, immobilization of this MIP on the screen printed electrodes because you said that you are going to immobilize on the surface of the screen printed electrodes and how are you preserve these MIPs until you are uh, going to proceed with your protein uh, the in fact of the MIPs we are not going we are not going to uh... Immobilize first on a uh, on a screen printed electrode. A little closer to the microphone, please, because uh, we cannot hear you. Yeah, you can hear me now. Okay. So uh, first of all, we need to obtain the nanoparticles, and the because the nanoparticles polymerize in the inverse mini emulsion environment, uh, the protein will be entrapped inside the particles and on the surface of the particle. So we don't have covalent bonding. We only have a uh, physical interaction with the protein because the protein is extracted at the purifying step. So mainly this is the first step to try to bind the protein to the polymeric biocompatible polymeric surface. And afterwards we could see the, uh, as I said in the perspectives, we should see first the affinity of the protein towards our nanoparticles. But uh, right now, we didn't take into account the immobilization of these particles on a screen printed electrode right now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Anna Lorena Nag with uh, lipopolysaccharides detection by space by uh, SPC based on innovative carbon based formulations with embedded molecularly imprinted particles. Lorena. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. I will share uh, my screen immediately. We cannot hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. It's okay. Perfect. Start the slideshow, please. Okay. So it can be seen. Yes, we can see your presentation, but it's not in slideshow mode. 
put K in it. Hope it's good now. Yes. So okay. hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, the uh, study, the preliminary study entitled Lipopolysaccharide Detection by SPC based on innovative carbon paste formulation with embed molecularly imprinted uh, particles. So the outcome of the presentation will consist on a short introduction about the increase of the antibiotic resistance of gram-negative bacteria due to the pandemic, methodology results, and of course, some final conclusion. So as you know, the overuse and misuse of antibiotics without the prior recommendation of a doctor, especially in the pandemic, is the main factor of the emergence of superbug bacteria and the causes of infections with bacillus such as uh, Pyocyanic bac uh, bacillus, aka Pseudomonas aeruginosa, both in hospital environment and community. So many hospitalized uh, COVID-19 patients have been receiving antibiotic, but uh, relatively few have actually had bacterial co-infection or secondary infection. So this means that many antibiotics have been administrated to patients unnecessarily, therefore contributing to the spread of the antimicrobial resistance, resistance of superbug bacteria. So in this context, it is mandatory to develop new low-cost methods of bacterial detection to extend the lifespan of the remaining antibiotic in use. So uh, this work will present a biosensor development based on the embedment of molecularly printed particles, which were capable to uh, recognize and revive with, with the chosen target. So in our case, uh, where uh, is the lipopolysaccharide from the superbug bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which consists in 75% uh, of uh, its uh, cell wall surface. So uh, in order to develop such, sen such sensors, uh, two stages were uh, required. So the first stage is represented by the uh, molecular and pretty particles obtaining. So the basic principle of the, LP, the LPS molecular impurity consists in the formation of polymer shells that possess complementary shape, size, and chemical properties with the used target molecule after the template extraction. Due to the formation of a stable and polymerizable complex between the template and the implied functional monomers. Thus, we previously synthesized one series of MIP particles to soldier solution, which were further embedded inside the carbon paste formulation. Here, two solutions were prepared while containing the target molecule LPS, the functional monomers, the orsenaptis, and the CTAB, the surfactant CTAB, dissolved in ethanol, and the second one containing the catalytic medium based on ammonium hydroxide water mixture. So the second stage is represented by the actual embedment of the MIP particles in the carbon paste formulation and the deposition of the carbon formulation onto the working surface of an SPC. So the MIP carbon paste formulation consisted in a homogenization of MIP particles together with the conductive carbon paste, zinc oxide electroactive particles, acetone, which was used as a solvent, and polyethylene glycol, which was used as a binder. So the final mixture was deposited onto the working surface of an SPC through drop casting method. So both MIPS and NIPS particles and MIPS and NIPS carbon page formulation were characterized from uh, structural and morphological point of view to demonstrate the successful embedment of the MIP particles into the drop-casted carbon page formulation. So from structural point of view, it can be observed that in the MIPS and NIPS spaced uh, spectra are found the characteristic peaks of the carbon paste, but also the one characteristic for the MIPS and NIPS particles and zinc oxide. So uh, the same micrograph for the MIPS and NIPS particles uh, reveal the relatively porous, less regular spherical particles grouped in micro and nanosphere or cluster aggregates, ranging in size from a few hundred nanometers to a few microns. Also, the open sensor presents a, comp uh, a complex uh, morphology. It can be seen a good particle embedment in the carbon paste formulation compared with the bare SPCE. Or, and also bodies with the hexagonal base or irregular bodies, which uh, is characteristic to the zinc oxide particles. And also we can, be, uh, we can see a much more porous structure for the MIP sensor compared to their homologues. So the obtained sensor were also subjected to topographic analysis. The roughness of the electrodes working surface was obtained from the AFM topological images. So it can be observed that the MIP CTAB SPC present a higher uh, surface uh, roughness equal to 467 nanometer with a standard deviation of 280 nanometer compared with their uh, non imprinting homologues. So in this case, MIP CTAB SPC, it can be seen that the small particles are almost uniformly distributed on the surface of the drop casted carbon paste formulation. We sustain the same results uh, for the successful embedment on the surface and also inside the carbon paste formulation. 
So further on, the sensor were subjected to cyclic voltammetry and differential pulse voltammetry testes. These one were the preliminary ones. So several CVs at 100 uh, millivolt uh, scan rate were performed for both uh, MIPS and MIPS sensor in a solution of 0,1 ferrocyanide, ferrocyanide, sodium chloride electrolyte solution in the presence of one milligram per milliliter LTS solution at different contact times, which shows an anodic and the cathodic peaks that become more obvious with the increase of the contact time. So after the addition of the LPS solution at different contact times, it can be observed that the oxidation current intensity increased considerably due to a positive gap of the anodic peak potential. So this growth phenomena can be attributed to an absorption phenomena, mainly attributed to the MIPCT BSPC, where we can be seen um, oxidation peak displacement revealed from 0.44 volts to 0.58 volts, along with the increase of the LPS contact time, which can confirm the rebinding of the LPS fragments onto the working surface of the biosensors. Also, the DPV results show that after the contact with an LPS solution, the peak current decreased simultaneously with the increase of the contact time, especially for the MIPS CTAB SPC. So this phenomena can also be attributed to the rebinding of the LPS fragments in the form cavities of the embedded particles. So consequently, the obtained modified electrodes with embed particles inside the deposit carbon based formulation can be a sustainable alternative for MIP detection from Pseudomonas aeruginosa due to the low cost of manufacture and the ease of de development due to the small materials required. And also as future perspective for this work, we propose the optimization of the sensor, the establishment of a regeneration protocol for the sensor reusability, and also the sens sensitivity and selectivity test against other LPS types from different bacteria through other techniques such as electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lorena, for your presentation. Uh, we will also expect your input for the round table, which yes. will be around uh, 3 p.m. Uh, specifically on the topic of uh, uh, research internships at uh, laboratories abroad. We have one question from the room. Yes, sure. Hello, Lorena, and congratulations. Just a short Thank and you. not difficult one. The same, stability of the sensor, how you are preserving and how you are maintaining these sensor, biosensors, in fact. So, uh, to preserve and to reuse the sensor. So I intend- Not only to... the, re the reuse, yes, but after testing them, how are you keeping them to be sure that at the next test, you will uh, expect the same sensitivity? At so uh, I used, to, I uh, intend to do a um, protocol to reuse the sensors, um, mainly to wash them with uh, some kind of solvents uh, in order to preserve them and uh, remove the LPS from the cavities. No, and no, to, it's not so complicated. Are you keeping in the fridge or in the buffer or how you are preserving um, them? Uh, it should be also uh, storage with uh, some type of um, silica gel packages as okay. uh, you can uh, buy the, from the metrom because uh, of the oxidation of the uh, electrodes, the endings. Okay. If That's you are not storing the, this, uh, I was it can be destroyed. It's enough. After then, I will discuss when you come back. Congratulations. Okay, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lorena. So the final work of uh, this, this uh, first part of um, section one, it's uh, synthesis and characterization of metal oxide photocatalyst with heterojunctions for wastewater treatment. And we have uh, an alternative method of presentation. So uh, Roxana Matei and Maria Grapin. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Maria Grapin. I'm a research assistant in team number 10 and together with my colleague Roxana Matei from team number seven, we are going to present our paper entitled Synthesis and Characterization of Metal Oxide Photocatalyst with Heterojunctions for Wastewater Treatment. 
The rapid progress of global industry has led to environmental pollution and in particular to wastewater containing non-biodegradable compounds, which has affected the ecosystem and human health. The abundance of non-biodegradable and toxic antibiotics in aqueous effluents has led to their inefficiency of their removal using uh, common methods. A dense oxidation processes can solve this pr uh, problem by creating reactive species that um, uh, irradiate um, by uh, solar um, irradiation. Uh, which is a uh, sustainable and uh, efficient technology for removing non-biodegradable compounds. Therefore, the aim of this work is to examine the photocatalytic degradation of the pharmaceutical product, ceftriaxone, using hydroxyapatite doped with various metal oxides. Starting with the principles of a photocatalysis, uh, figure one shows a schematic illustration of uh, semiconductor photoactivation and electron pair generation. So, uh, photocatalysis on semiconductor photocatalyst involves three main steps. In the first step, irradiation of light with uh, energy higher than the semiconductor band gap will be generated the electron in the, the conduction band and um, holes in the valence band pairs in the semiconductor photocatalyst. In the second step, both electrons and holes migrate to the surface, um, uh, semiconductor surface. And uh, in the last step, the photogenerated molecule oxidizes water molecule to form hydroxyl radical, while the photogenerated electron uh, reduces dissolved oxygen to form a superoxide radical anion. The formation of hydroxyl radical and superoxide radical anion with uh, higher oxidation potential can degrade the organic pollutant into readily biodegradable compounds. As for metal oxide semiconductors, they are promising candidates for semiconductor photocatalysis because um, of their light absorbing properties, change transfer characteristics, lifetime of excited state, electronic structures, but they suffer for inefficiency of photocatalytic activation in visible light. Therefore, to overcome this disadvantage and to improve the photocatalytic activation in visible light, coupling metal oxide with other metals to form heterojunctions has been used. In this study, hydroxyapatite was used as support due to its high level of activity in many photocatalytic reaction systems. The schematic process of uh, the um, uh, synthesis of metal oxide photocatalyst is uh, shown in uh, figure two. Hydroxyapatite metal ions and um, the sodium carbonate were dissolved in ethylene glycol. Uh, the mixture has been uh, stirred well dispersed. The, the photocatalyst synthesis was carried out in a discovered 2.0 microwave flow reactor at 160 degrees Celsius, 300 watt power for 10 minutes. In order to determine which metal ions is more effective, we perform five samples as shown in table one. As an application, we have chosen to present the degradation of ceftriaxone from aqueous effluents. This is the third generation cephalosporin class antibiotics used in uh, treatment of bacterial infections. Um, so uh, for this purpose, the synthesis photocatalyst um, were mis mixed with um, styrene acrylic film forming material and deposed on a glass surface. The photocatalytic activity was evaluated by the exonotest lamp as shown in figure seven. So, um, you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> I can hear myself. Uh, we characterize the obtained materials through several modern techniques. The reflectance spectra tells us how much and uh, in uh, which way the incident light is um, uh, reflected. Uh, the um, uh, lower reflectance values of the spectrum implies a darker color of the sample. Uh, 
considering the minimum points of the spectra, we can determine uh, where the absorbance of light, absorbance of, light uh, of the color takes place and also the wavelength of the maximum assertion. In this way, being able to identify um, the colors of the powders. Uh, we can also calculate um, the trichroma trichromatic coordinates, uh, which are um, which characterize the colors in three-dimensional space. And uh, after this, uh, the SIALEB coordinates, uh, being able to compare the colors obtained and uh, evaluate the shade deviation. In Figure Nine, uh, we have um, presented the thermogram of the developed materials. Uh, the um, thermogram reveals a residue at 750 Celsius degrees of approximately 94% for all the samples. The mass uh, loss is uh, being divided in two stages. Stage one, from the room temperature to 150 Celsius degrees, uh, with a mass loss of approximately 2%, is uh, attributed to the uh, desorption of the absorbed water from the surface of the powders. And stage two, from 150 to uh, 500 Celsius degrees, with a mass loss of approximately 4%, which can be attributed to the loss of lattice water. The um, stage two represents the main uh, weight loss of the um, weight mass loss, uh, being uh, also attributed with other um, to other phenomena that uh, appear uh, the, uh, the dehydroxylation of the phosphorus hydroxyl group. In Figure Ten, we have presented the same images of uh, three of the synthesized materials: cobalt, chromium, and copper hydroxyapatite composites. We can uh, see that uh, the nanoparticles form are uh, with uh, shape, uh, spherical uh, shape, and um, are being dis uh, with crumb distributions. Uh, the edux uh, spectra are presented for the same three samples, and uh, that um, demonstrates uh, the presence of the metal ions we we used in the synthesis of the metal oxide hydroxyapatite composites. The UV, UV spectra uh, presented in this slide uh, uh, presents the photo decomposition of Chafor, the drug you used uh, in the studies using uh, the, um, the iron uh, hydroxyapatite composite. The peak observed at 274 nanometers is um, a characteristic for the um, aromatic systems. In this case, two amino thiazole, uh, from the antibiotic structure. The um, uh, photodegradation uh, was being observed from uh, zero to 330 minutes. Uh, the peak at uh, 274 uh, nanometers is uh, the moment when the degradation starts. The presence of the isobastic point at 355 nanometers uh, implies the existence of two species that uh, transform into each other. The photo decomposition process is a, a slow process uh, that uh, being caused by the presence of the sulfur atoms in the um, drug molecule that uh, can um, poison the catalysts. Uh, the catalysts formed uh, with the transitional metals. So in conclusion, photocatalytic degradation of drugs in the presence of metal oxide uh, and hydroxyapatite composites is an effective uh, technique for the treatment of aqueous solutions. The reaction mechanism suggests that uh, the degradation occurs starting with two amino thiazole verified by the yellowing of the photocatalytic plate. Uh, hydroxyapatite doped copper presents the higher photocatalytic performances. In order to evaluate the composition of the effluents after degradation, HPLC CMS and total organic carbon analysis will be performed. In the future, we aim to optimize the synthesis process at laboratory scale in order to obtain materials with higher photocatalytic performance. Also, we propose to obtain materials with both photocatalytic and assertion properties to investigate the possibi possibility of regeneration and um, in order to integrate them into a depollution technology. We will also evaluate the possibility of obtaining hydroxyapatite using natural resources. We forgot to mention before that uh, these uh, studies are um, the part of our internal grant. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, uh, as this is the at the beginning of the grant, you obtain some interesting results, uh, and together with uh, your mentor, you should uh, optimize them. If we have any questions from the room, no, or from the the online, it doesn't seem like we have any questions. So uh, thank you for your presentation. And we will take a short break. Uh, 25 minutes uh, up to uh, 1 50 p.m. Because uh, we are a little bit late. So uh, at 3.30 uh, p.m. we had uh, an information uh, round table. So 